you know, in the medical industry, there are the same things where we have standard components that we need to um, keep below a set limit, just like in the electronics, cooling, telecom, datacom industry. Um, if you look at the MRI um, type machine here, you can see that there are, um, are basically capacitors, um, PCBs, transceivers, um, and other components that need to be kept at a, cer at a certain limit. Um, however, the, the differences are that there's also typically a need for an isothermal environment. In other words, this entire tube that um, a person would, would sit in has to be kept at an isothermal temperature for reliability and accuracy reasons. Um, so, so this isothermal requirement is not typically something dealt with in the, um, the standard telecom application. Um, next, there's applications that um, require temperatures or fluids to be quickly cycled in temperature, um, things such as DNA replication or um, liquid or tissue analysis. Um, for DNA replication, temperature fluctuations must be undertaken um, between 10 to 100 times per second um, between two very tight temperature limits, higher and lower. Um, and again, this is something that's not typically seen um, in other applications when it comes to thermal management. Uh, the other um, difference would be the miniaturization um, for orthoscopic and other type of surgeries. Uh, mini forceps and uh, clamps, that sort of thing, um, all need uh, heat management, but in a very small package. So again, um, just a couple of the unique change, uh, challenges to keep in mind when we're talking about medical applications. Of course, the biggest difference now is the human factor, the human interaction uh, that's not seen with other types of electronics equipment. Um, material selection is now critical. Um, some materials such as copper or so uh, have to be used sparingly or they have to be coated, kept away from the outside of the, um, of the component as they can cause tissue irritation and other um, conditions. There's also some very tight constraints in the medical application because we are talking about small instruments. Um, and again, um, you know, small for things like small forceps and miniaturized heat pipes are all um, have applications in the medical industry. The constant temperature, um, isothermal temperatures I mentioned before, uh, temperature uniformity. And of course, the, the other really big thing that we have to worry about in the medical application is FDA requirements. Um, you know, this is similar to um, NEBS or MILSPEC requirements in the telecom datacom industry, but now um, we're dealing with the FDA. So some of the general applications that we'll talk about are uh, stationary uses of, of um, medical equipment, EKG machines, ultrasound, MRI, uh, handheld devices, defibrillators, and forceps. And then the third, which is a very large component of the research we do, which is the biotech research, um, your tissue analysis, DNA replication, um, etc. So some of the factors that uh, lead to challenges in the thermal design, like everything else, um, unquestioned reliability. Uh, when we're, of course, now we're dealing with humans, and we have that um, that additional factor to keep in mind when we're talking about reliability and accuracy. Um, instruments with greater accuracy and capability, reduced size and miniaturization, and cost constraints, like any other industry, are becoming um, really stringent when we when we talk about doing designs or um, uh, new evaluations of thermal management in the medical industry. So for diagnostic imaging, um, things like x-rays, MRIs, um, here it's very important that the temperature um, of the device or of the sensing head uh, must be kept isothermal and must be repeatable. Every time the machine's turned on and throughout the day, the temperature should be constant uh, to maintain accuracy. Uh, this can be challenging because there are also spot um, heat loads within the unit that can be quite high. So the heat flux itself is nice and thermal, but yet the temperature must be. So this uh, creates a challenge um, for the thermal designer. And, and of course, now that you have a person here, things like noise um, must be limited to ensure the, the personal comfort of the patient. And uh, surfaces that may need to be cleaned or sterilized, um, you know, are, again, a little bit of a um, wrinkle added into the design process. A sample analysis and screening is another another. Um, application in the medical industry that uses a lot of thermal uh, design and knowledge. Um, automated tests for body fluids, um, they typically use TCs or heat pipes um, and are often liquid cooled to maintain a very uniform t uh, temperature of the sample over a long um, period of time. Um, this sort of application is the case study that I'll talk about um, in the second half of the presentation. And um, we came up with a unique way to uh, 
basically have an isothermal temperature that's repeatable over a long period of time. Um, it's a very unique application, so we'll get into that in the second part um, of the presentation. Next is biotech uh, research. Um, the, the major example in this field is the DNA replicators uh, because they really have a tight requirement when it comes to cycling temperature uh, of the DNA uh, to promote PR, uh, PCR. And what we try to do here is, is put in as many cycles between the upper and lower temperature limits per second as possible. And this helps to replicate the DNA quicker, uh, which reduces the actual cost um, of operating the unit. And again, repeatability and accuracy um, in this type of instrument is very important uh, to maintain accuracy of your samples and of your analysis from, um, from day to day. So the conclusion for the first part of this presentation I wanted just to highlight again is that the thermal management and medical fields share some common challenges um, in terms of cooling high-powered components and high-powered spot loads. You know, at the end of the day, we need to take the heat from the heat-producing components and move them to the ambient um, in as efficient a manner as possible. Uh, where medical has um, a couple new challenges are the things that I've outlined previously, the isothermal challenges, um, typically in telecom or datacom, that's not really important. Um, cycling temperatures, as well as repeatability. So every time the machine's turned on and warms up, it's, it's hitting the same target uh, time after time for accuracy. And, and of course, the, the last really different, big difference in the medical field is the human factor, the human interaction that we have to account for. Um, trying to make the patient as comfortable as possible while keeping accuracy and repeatability quite high. So the case study that um, I want to talk about a little bit today is um, a project we did for a, tis a tissue analyzer. Uh, basically a uh, customer came to us with the requirement that they need to perform um, analysis and sampling of this tissue over a six hour or so period, a six hour work day. And their major requirements are this tissue is embedded in um, an optimal cutting temperature fluid uh, which holds it stationary and allows for a coring of the sample. And what they're really looking for is a constant temperature over, over the workday um, and a repeatable temperature, as well as uh, the ability to use this in a milling machine or a coring machine that would take the sample and analyze it. So a couple of the design goals we needed. Um, the temperature requirement for this tissue was negative 70 degrees C, um, and it needed to hold a steady negative 70 degrees C uh, for six hours or more. Uh, we need to ensure upper vis visibility uh, because there would be a, um, a technician using this machine, it was imperative that they have visibility of the samples um, while they're being analyzed. Uh, and the reason this is important is that um, we couldn't just um, insulate or enclose the, set of the sample within the system because the operator had to um, actually take a look at it during the process. The third design goal um, which became quite a challenge at negative 70 degrees C was to eliminate the humidity within the system. Um, because these tissue samples had to be open to the environment uh, in order to core and analyze them, um, it was very important to keep humidity and uh, moisture in the air away from the samples, which could contaminate them and uh, lead to inaccurate results. Uh, of course, fro frost buildup is also an issue. Um, if you have uh, frost building up the samples, that would also impact the accuracy and the, the reliability of the machine. So as a general overview, uh, what we came up with is uh, this is a, a prototype sample that sits on a, um, on a slide, and then we have a quarry machine that will come down. And I want to just give you an overview before I get into it so that you can kind of keep an idea um, in your head of what we're talking about. So basically we have a reservoir here in the center um, that holds the uh, cooling medium. Uh, the tissue samples are loaded in the top uh, through this opening here. And then we have a duct that, that cycles cool air over the samples um, to maintain its temperature and humidity requirements. So a little uh, section view of um, the process I just described. Uh, what we have is a, the sample here is in green, and that's, again, the tissue embedded in a um, cutting fluid that's uh, frozen. That tissue sits in a loom cassette, which can be loaded and um, extracted uh, from the device. And we have a duct that passes um, cold, and very dry air over the sample, um, so the room humidity won't come and collect on that sample and cause frost. That um, room air, I'm sorry, that uh, circulated air uh, passes through a desiccant to remove the humidity, passes through a heat exchanger, which cools the air, and then goes back and repeats the cycle over the sample. 
so this convection cooling through the duct is really aimed at just that top surface of the tissue. Um, if you think of the tissue as a six-sided box, five of the sides are being cooled via conduction, and that sixth surface is being cooled via convection over the top. For the five surfaces I just mentioned that are cooled by conduction, um, we have that cassette sitting in an aluminum cassette receiver, and that aluminum cassette receiver is sitting in a dry ice and alcohol slurry. And uh, the reason this dry ice and alcohol slurry was selected is that it's very repeatable. Um, the temperature of this, of this slurry mixture is constant over time. Um, it doesn't warm up slowly. It really stays at about negative 70 or C or so until the dry ice is used up. And once the dry ice is used and evaporated, um, the temperature slowly begins to climb. Um, so we have a um, slurry reservoir here and then insulation around that reservoir. So what's nice is that uh, the aluminum fins extend down into this dry ice and ethyl alcohol slurry. And as the slurry evaporates, um, it stays in contact with the fins as the fluid level drops. Um, and this is important to give us those six hours of required um, cooling time that we needed. So a little, um, a little bit more detailed CAD view of the system. Uh, you can see the cassettes I was talking about where the sample um, fits on the inside. So the sample is located right in this area. This cassette then drops into the cassette receiver, um, which contacts it on five sides, uh, which allows for conduction cooling. The cassette receiver is then dropped into the um, reservoir here. And this reservoir um, allows fluid to be filled up to um, conduct into these um, cassette receiver fins here. You can see there's a double walled design, and this allows for insulation to be placed in this area, um, which helps uh, keep the temperature lower for a longer period of time when used in a lab environment. The reservoir itself um, was tested using CFD analysis and um, actual laboratory testing. So what we uh, saw here was that through CFD testing, it was estimated that the critical temperature below 70 C was maintained for 9.7 um, hours with no insulation in this doubled wall design. The overall heat loss over that time was about 11 watts um, in a normal lab operating environment. So what we want to show here um, with the actual laboratory testing is the reservoir temperature as a function of time and depth. So as the alcohol slurry evaporated, we needed to keep an idea of uh, keep track of the temperature over that time period to see um, if it would remain within our critical requirements. And what we can see here, uh, the pink line is shown here. This is the top of the reservoir, and you can see that as the alcohol is now evaporating and the slurry is dropping in height, um, the temperature crosses over that um, negative 70 degrees uh, threshold much too quickly, only after about one hour or so. So by extending the fins now down into the fluid, we can extend that time out to almost nine hours for both the middle and the bottom fins. Uh, and what this allowed us to do is just make more efficient use of the cooling medium that we had um, available to us. The cassette um, receiver um, design was, is very similar um, in design to a classic heat sink approach that we, that we talk about. We have the cassette receiver here, um, which is similar to a heat sink base, um, if you want to tie it into that sort of application. And then we have the, um, the fins coming down, which are very similar to heat sink fins um, as they spread heat from the base down into the fins. So, you know, a comparison point between medical industry cooling and then classic electronics cooling is shown here on the right where we use the classic fin um, optimization equations and the conduction equations to optimize this medical device, just like we would if we were trying to optimize a heat sink um, for a forced convection application. So uh, basically what we're, what we're looking at is a CFD analysis and an analytical analysis of the temperature differential through these fins um, up into the cassette receiver. And what we want to make sure, of course, is that the temperature differential between the fins, bottom surface here, and the cassette receiver was as small as possible. Uh, we then took and machined um, the cassette receiver shown here out of actual aluminum uh, to do our testing in the lab. You can see that we took this cassette receiver and we placed a small cassette um, filled with just a sterilized solution in the cassette um, here. This, this again was all thermocoupled up um, to measure temperature over time. Um, what you can see on the right hand side is basically the average temperatures as a function of location. 
So we have uh, thermocouples in the very bottom of the fin, the middle of the fin, and then into the top of the fin or the base of the cassette receiver. We also have thermocouples in the actual fluid itself, the cassette, and then the top of the cassette receiver. So what we're trying to figure out is what's the temperature differential between the very base of that fin that's contacting the fluid all the way up until the actual tissue sample itself. And what you can see here is that there's about two and a half degree difference between the coldest point on the bottom of the fin um, into the actual um, tissue sample itself. So this was um, deemed a success as we were able to manage that conduction resistance effectively um, using um, the cassette receiver and fin approach. The, um, the next uh, method of cooling the sample, and one of the more challenging is to cool that top surface and um, to, to essentially dry it um, to, again, avoid the moisture and frost problem. So for the convection cooling, what we have is we have a heat exchanger here. Um, and this heat exchanger um, basically extends out into the dry house knock call slurry that, it, that is um, contained in this reservoir here. So the heat exchanger is cooled on one side by that dry, dry ice and alcohol slurry. It extends now into the duct and cools the air passing over it. Um, we did this because we we're using the same cooling medium uh, to cool both the sample from conduction and convection to ensure that there's no temperature differential throughout the sample. And the sample itself is, is as isothermal as possible. So we have um, a fan here that's blowing air uh, through the duct. It comes in through the heat exchanger. And through the section view, it'll come up through this um, diffuser section up top. And this diffuser section takes the air from the duct, spreads it out um, over the samples, and creates kind of a barrier between the lab um, ambient environment and the samples themselves. So we kind of create a cushion of air over the top of that sample uh, to ensure that moisture or um, heat isn't transferred into the sample. Um, we used a, a senior Denke fan uh, to uh, give us the flow rate and pressure drop that we needed. Um, and it was important here is to test the fan at a lower um, temperature, negative 80 degrees C or so, which it performed um, very nicely. Um, the heat exchanger here, um, you can see this is an exploded view. Basically one side of this heat exchanger is sitting into the slurry. The heat is exchanged uh, through the base of the heat sink here into the fins. And the air that from the um, fan is blown into the heat sink through the fins where it's cooled and then returned back into the duct. Again, the optimization of um, this heat exchanger is very similar to a, a classic heat sink optimization we would use in a telecom um, environment, um, where we, we basically have to optimize the heat sink in terms of pressure drop through the heat sink and surface area. So you can see um, it's too small a uh, number of fins here. It doesn't give us the surface area we need to transfer heat between the air and um, the slurry. And too many fins is um, basically too much of a pressure drop through the heat sink. It causes too much of a resistance to the fan, so the all overall volumetric flow rate um, is decreased. So we can see there's a sweet spot right in the middle of about 10 fins, um, which is the correct balance between surface area and pressure drop, um, which is what we went with for our design. Uh, the diffuser and duct are another source of pressure drop that we have to take into account. Um, basically what we, what we see here is um, the pressure drop associated with the diffuser um, section, which is shown here up top, and then the pressure drop of the air um, flow through the duct itself, um, through, the, through the multiple curves um, and that sort of thing. So if we go to the diffuser uh, test results, what you can see up here is the initial smoke flow um, test that we did, and you can see that there's a lot of mixing going on. Uh, the entrained air in the duct is coming into the diffuser and then escaping out to the room environment, um, which, which we found to be an issue. We took ATVS sensors. Um, I can circle them here in red. We took these sensors, um, which measure both air temperature and air velocity, and we uh, made an array of sensors. We then took that array and we moved it across the opening of the duct here um, to, to form basically a grid of velocity points. Um, to measure the effect of mixing between the duct um, and the in lab environmental um, ambient air. I can I can play it later. That's fine. Um, so what we what we're showing here on the on the right hand side um, in this Excel graph is basically 
um, the contour plot of the escaping air from this duct. And you can see that at the end of the duct in the middle is where the highest point is. There's a, between 100 and 150 LFM um, of airflow mixing for the lab environment. The reason this is an issue is because um, this mixing allows warmed, humid air uh, to enter the duct and that could potentially contaminate the samples. So that's something that we wanted to avoid um, if at all possible. Uh, using that, uh, that test information and um, the results of the, um, of the lab work, we, we took the old design um, duct seen here on the left and we redesigned it um, to a new design seen here on the right. So basically what we changed is we optimized the, um, the outlet radius, the diffuser outlet, and the way the duct uh, connection was formed. Uh, and this allowed us to really cut down the amount of mixing between the air flowing in the duct and the air and the um, ambient air in the lab. There's two videos here, which I'm not sure if can be seen. Um, we're going to just try to adjust our screen a bit so the videos will come through. Just bear with us for one moment. So we can see, um, hopefully, this, hopefully um, everybody out there can see these two videos going. If not at the end, I'll, um, I'll just play them uh, from Windows Media Player. But uh, what you can see here on the left-hand side is um, all the mixing going on with the old design. And then here on the right-hand side, um, you can see the, the reduced amount of mixing going on with the um, different duct outlet and diffuser. Uh, what this new design allowed is uh, much less heated uh, humid air into that duct, which... Um, gave us a little bit more headroom on the amount of desiccant we needed and um, the, the performance of the heat sink. Um, so the desiccant itself um, is entrained within the duct of the system and that of course removes humidity from the air. It prevents frost from building up in the samples and contaminating uh, the tissue. So the important part of this uh, molecular, molecular sieve uh, desiccant that we used um, was to reduce the dew point of the air below the temperature we were cooling it. So we were around um, negative 72 degrees or so Celsius, so we needed to reduce the um, dew point below that. Now the nice thing about this desk is at the end of the day, at the end of the testing cycle, it can be removed from the system, placed in the oven, and regenerated for the next day's use. Uh, the amount of, of um, desiccant needed is an important thing to, uh, to study because it has to work for the six hours or so needed. Um, it, to basically ensure that the desiccant itself isn't going to become saturated before the testing is over. So we went through those designs and we determined how much desiccant was needed now to be placed within the duct. Uh, there are two desiccants needed, um, or two desiccants tested, I'm sorry. Uh, one is a typical bead desiccant. It's um, kind of an off-the-shelf desiccant played in, uh, placed into a um, wire mesh screen. And uh, the other type of desiccant was a honeycomb structure. Um, it's a little bit more expensive, but the uh, performance was great. So this is a single monolithic uh, honeycomb structure that we used, and the pressure drop was quite a bit lower um, at 311 pascals than what we saw with the bead structure. Uh, so this allowed us to uh, have a little bit higher flow rate and more performance through the desiccant while still ensuring we had enough desiccant material and uh, volume to handle the humidity requirements over a six to eight hour life. So the final testing um, involved old convection cooling um, and the tissue modules assembled um, and tested both with air temperature and velocity um, sensors and with thermocouples. So you can see here how the, how the thermocouples are placed in the heat sinks, um, in the cassette receiver, in the actual cassette itself, and then the top view with the cover in place. So the final results um, for this system, um, what we're really interested in is the tissue temperature shown here in blue. So this blue line here is the tissue um, temperature. And you can see that over the six hour life uh, between these two set points, the, te the temperature of that sample, the tissue sample, was very constant and well below the negative 70 degrees C limit um, that we had to meet. 
And you can see that was until almost eight hours of life um, before the temperature of that tissue um, really went over the negative 70 and was warm beyond the usable temperature. Um, so at this point, the project was a success, and we'd met the original design goals. And, um, you know, we kind of went through all the steps needed, ensured um, with the customer that uh, the system would work for the length of time that they required, and um, met all the objectives. Uh, so the final conclusion I want to leave everybody here with today is that um, in the medical industry, the, the classic laws um, of thermodynamics that we adhere to when doing electronic schooling, um, you know, don't change. In terms of the fin, fin efficiencies, the heat sink optimizations, um, the pressure drop calculations, those are all standard calculations that we, we use regardless of application. In the medical industry, the telecom, datacom, consumer, um, wherever you happen to be designing. Uh, in the medical industry, though, there are a couple things that are important to keep in mind and um, often don't come up in the telecom industry, um, such as uh, repeatability of, of temperature, isothermal temperatures, um, and really high uh, heat loads or high heat fluxes um, that need to be spread out over much larger areas. Um, because of these, these additional challenges, it's important to consider thermal design even earlier in your overall mechanical design um, to really try to incorporate it into the system um, as much as possible. And of course, the big thing to keep in mind in the medical industry is the, the, the threat of lawsuits and um, the realization that instead of just working with electronics, we now have to deal with um, the human factor as well. So accuracy in an MRI scan or um, a CAT scan, that sort of thing, is even more important now, um, now that we have the human um, factor involved. So I hope that um, the kind of overview of the medical uh, uh, design that we went through was helpful and kind of uh, outlined some of the challenges that we deal with um, that are unique to the medical industry and how it's important to really th think of the thermal design that much sooner in your design stage and to not overlook the um, unique requirements uh, when designing a product or an instrument in the medical field. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it back over to John, and uh, he can do the summary. Great. Thanks, Mike. And thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, we're going to be having another webinar coming up uh, in about two weeks or so, so just check QATS.com to find out when the next one is. Uh, we have all of them listed there. In addition, we're going to be having the archived version of this webinar up on our website next, sometime next week, again, at QATS.com. You can follow us on at, twi uh, at uh, Twitter, uh, at QATS. You can also check out our blog at heatsinks.wordpress.com. Thanks, everybody, for joining with us. We appreciate it very much. And if you have any questions uh, as a result of this webinar that come to your mind later on, please feel free to go ahead and send them in, and we'll get them right over to Mike. Uh, you can send those to me at joday at qats.com. That's joday at qats.com. We'll, uh, we'll get your questions answered from the webinar uh, just as soon as we can, usually in a couple days or so. Thanks, everybody.